too many things at once. Here we go. So welcome everybody. And for our Digital Academy uh, students that participated in this one week sprint, they've spent the last five days creating an augmented reality experience. And they were making this experience of gnomes that were inspired by the physical gnomes that were created during the uh, two weeks of workshops at the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, our foundation students and four of the students here in our Digital Academy as well participated in the sprint and also in the in-person experience where they built gnomes much like you see here. And we'll learn a little bit more about this gnome uh, in a moment. They were working in new software, Adobe Dimension and Adobe Arrow, and together they built and delivered AR gnomes, which will eventually be displayed at the Urban Ecology Center in late September at Hike Milwaukee. As always uh, with our students, we love working in Mural. And so Mural was one of the main delivery devices for a lot of the information that we were doing. And I just always love to show that whole complete breadth of our Mural, all the post-it notes, all the colored portions that you see here are activities that the students were doing. However, most of this week actually was not spent in Mural. We did a lot more uh, and to talk a little bit about that, I want to introduce our expert, Chris Willie from UWM, uh, who was our uh, lead educator for the week, teaching us this new software and running this experience. So Chris, uh, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I, I just want to take a second and thank everyone involved, I want, especially Matt and Jess for helping organize this amazing experience. The whole team at Islands of Brilliance just knocks it out of the park every single time. Uh, the From the mentors, and then of course we couldn't be here without the students, these brilliant minds. So sincerely, thank you all for the time and effort and energy. We started planning this uh, workshop back in, uh, I think January, and we had pretty, uh, you know, a bunch of meetings. And software changes. And over the time, uh, the presentation isn't on my screen right now. I don't know uh, if it's changed. There we are. Yeah, so software changes. And one of the things that happened during the planning of this is the software was kind of pulled out from underneath us. Uh, Adobe Dimension, which is a very simplified 3D assembly, not a modeling program, but it's a program where you take 3D models and the things that wrap around them called materials and you assemble them together. That program changed. And so we actually have to like do something special to download that program these days. And then the other thing you might notice here with the other bit of software, these are two icons that you usually click on to open the software. One looks like it has a grid behind it. This is Adobe Aero. Now, Adobe Aero usually exists on a device like a smartphone or an iPad. And Adobe Aero is this really simple program for augmented reality. Let's take a second, step back. I think some of us here know what augmented reality is. Others might not, they, they might have heard of this term, but they might not know it. So augmented reality is a type of uh, extended reality, which is an umbrella term that holds both virtual reality and augmented reality. Now, a really easy way to understand the difference between these two things is with virtual reality, we put goggles on and we go inside the information. With augmented reality, we hold a device in front of us and information comes to us. And that's a really easy way to distinguish between virtual reality and augmented reality. Prior to Adobe Aero, augmented reality required a lot of code, both on software and for websites, because it's an information that's delivered through a website. And what Adobe does is they make it so you don't have to know the code. You push buttons and pull sliders. And so it's a very easy and user-friendly way to use Adobe Aero to create augmented reality experiences. But I go back to that grid. That grid stands for beta, meaning this software isn't quite fully developed for the desktop yet. And my friends, we ran into some issues. We found some bugs together. And one of the big things about 
playing with new software that I want to teach everybody who I get a chance to work with is the idea of resilience. When we are growing, just like a plant, we have to be resilient. We have to be able to bend with the challenges that come our way and grow towards the things that are easy to grow towards. And part of the challenge of growing towards new technologies is you run into bugs. And so we shared with the team some strategies because it can be frustrating, right? When you, you click on something and it doesn't work or you straight up run into a challenge that you can't easily fix. And so we had so many great moments. We had, there, there was a moment where literally a student was like, oh, that's so cool. I'm sorry, I, I'm breaking your ears if you have headphones on, but that just gives you an idea of the wow moments that Islands of Brilliance delivered this week um, to be able to actually like get things to move and see them. It was, it was beautiful. But the challenge is, Matt, if you wanna go forward one slide, the main challenge that we learned was the, the strategy of resilience. And I, I, I share three Ps with my students over in the Immersive Media Lab, which I'm a director of, and in the college classes in the Creative Technologies Department over at the Peck School of the Arts, because we often run into these challenges. And everything that grows needs to understand how to use and conserve the energy that they're growing with. I know this sounds kind of hippy dippy, but it really works for me. They need to understand how to use and conserve that energy. And sometimes when we're frustrated, it's really good to pause. Take a deep breath and maybe even pause completely and walk away. Get some vitamin D, hug a friend, share what's going on. Sometimes we need to pivot. Like, okay, I can't grow this way. I need to find another way to grow. And so I'm just going to turn toward another kind of light to grow towards. And sometimes we actually have to keep pushing. And that doesn't mean you just keep doing the same things again and again. That's the definition of not quite right in the head, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna push through smart. We wanna push through and find more knowledge by either reaching out to an expert. We wanna push through and maybe teach ourselves some more stuff by finding some tutorials. But either way, it's gonna require a lot more energy to push through. So those are the strategies that we were talking about. And I am so thankful. It's not necessarily a deliverable, though you will see some amazing deliverables today. But in Digital Academy, we're all about that soft skill and resilience and being able to pivot, pause, and push harder. These are soft skills that your students encountered this week. And I am so proud of them. They did amazing things. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share some of these newer technologies with students and teach them how to navigate some of the ambiguities that come up when we play with new software. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and next, uh, it was an amazing week to watch all of the things that the students were able to achieve and also achieve in spite of some of really uh, large challenges. So uh, to introduce a little bit more background and history about the project, uh, we're going to hand it over to Jess Schaefe, uh, our co-educator in Digital Academy. All right. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to give a little background to the stars of our show, the gnomes. Um, you can click to the next one. Awesome. So we had three different workshops at three at the three urban ecology centers. So Riverside, Menominee Valley, and what's the third one? Washington, Washington Park. Park. Thank you. Um, so at each location, students learned about the environment that they were in within the park. Um, and then they also got to really dig deep into um, gnomes and gnome lore. And uh, we were able to bring in Co Douglas from UWM. Um, and he's very passionate and knowledgeable on the subject. So he shared that knowledge with our students. So they walked away with all of this new learning around gnomes. Um, and then they took that learning and created physical gnomes. And you can click to the next slide, which you see here. These are our six physical gnomes that students um, created with the help of Kim Beckman, also from UWM. Um, she brought in her knowledge of 
plant-based materials. We only use things that um, were appropriate for the environment that um, they were in, nothing that would harm um, the parks because these gnomes are gonna be placed around the parks and be there for a while. Um, so as you can see, all of these gnomes are made from similar materials, but all very unique in their construction. So students took what they learned from Co, what they learned from the environment that they were in and created these amazing physical gnomes. Um, so now they're just kind of hanging out there until hike MKE. Um, but what they also did for us was they um, gave the inspiration for our DA students and creating their augmented reality version of the gnomes. So they did not need to be mirror images of the gnomes. They did not have to be twins. They were just supposed to be inspiration that our DA students then created kind of the spirit version of, this digital version of. Um, and just a little background on gnomes themselves. I'm glad Ko's not here or he probably, I'll probably get it wrong. But basically gnomes are stewards of the land that they're on. So they are protecting the environment that they find themselves in. Um, and they do that with these kind of superpowers or magical abilities um, that they innately have that they th then use to preserve and protect that which is around them. Um, so each of these gnomes has a story um, that the students created in teams. And then that story was shared with our DA students to help with that inspiration of their creation. So I'm just gonna briefly go through um, kind of the background of each gnome so that when you see them in their digital form, it'll make a lot more sense that way too. So our first one is Oliver. Uh, this little guy lives in a hut in the forest. His um, thing that he protects are the plants and the animals of the forest. Um, so he makes sure that they're all safe and it is peaceful in the forest. And he listens to animals and what they need. Um, Oliver's superpowers is that he has night vision to catch predators when it's dark. He can move around by flying with his ears and enjoys a good spaghetti and barbecue pizza dinner. So this is Oliver, which you will see in digital form coming up. All right, our next gnome is Tilver. Tilver is a garden gnome, not your typical garden gnome. Um, no red pointy hat on this guy. Um, this gnome protects the food in the garden at the UEC, which the students actually got to see and experience. So it keeps away animals and people that want to destroy the garden. Uh, lives under the ground, hibernates in the winter when the garden is dead. This guy has a lot of superpowers. Um, can control the weather, also has night vision goggles to see in the dark. Does a rain dance to create the rain. Spins in circles to make the sun come up has a staff to control the temperature, up for hotter, down for cooler, and gets rid of bugs on the plants with his frog tongue. So as you can see, a lot of creativity goes into these gnomes um, and a lot of storytelling, which is a big part of the gnomes as well. Our next one is Periwinkle. Um, Periwinkle takes care of the lake. Um, and this one, we are at Washington Park and the lake is really the central part of the park. Um, so you'll see that there's a lot of water features with these particular gnomes because the lake and the water was a really integral part of the park. Um, so Periwinkle is beautiful and kind. Uh, Periwinkle's superpowers are that they have wings so they can fly to save animals in danger, swoops down and grabs them and carries them to safety, can turn into a butterfly when it needs to hide, uh, communicates with butterflies, um, so they tell her when animals are in danger and can control the lake water to keep it from getting too low or too high. So another thing to mention about gnomes is that many of them can shape shift, so they don't always stay in the same form. They can turn into animals, bugs, other um, environmental features around them, so that can be one of their superpowers, which you'll see in some of our digital versions as, as well. This little guy is Rainkeeper, protects the animals in and around the lake, again, at the UEC, lives by a tree, lives in a tree by the lake so that he can see everything from his house. Uh, Rainkeeper's superpowers are that he controls the water, keeps water levels steady and helps drowning animals, has a magic wand to control the water, raises it to make the water rise and lowers it to bring the water down. Our next one is Aspen, and this was from the Menominee Valley location. Um, Aspen is a keeper of the animals, so feeds the animals acorns they have gathered and store in their pouch. Uh, superpowers that they communicate with all animals as they are made up 
of many different animals. So um, this particular one was a combination of a lot of different animals, river otter mouth, wolf eyes, raccoon tail, mouse ears, prairie chicken cheeks. So again, you'll see how that is then interpreted by our DA students and created in that digital realm. Our last one was our only villain of the bunch. Um, not everyone can be a good guy. Uh, this is Slither, the villain of the forest, was a good guy at one point until of course it was bitten by a dragon. Um, and in that battle did lose its eye, hence the eye patch. Um, and now likes to play tricks on people. So steals bells from around the area and just buries them out in the woods and then tickles people's toes while they sleep. You might've experienced this. Uh, and then of course steals a sock so that you don't have a matching pair, which is kind of the worst of all evils. Um, superpowers for Slither are teleportation using the water. Um, again, uh, this particular park did have a river going through it. So again, a water feature and can turn into an armadillo when it is in danger. As you can see from that nice back um, situation it's got going on there, a good protection piece for that gnome. So now we are gonna be going into students' individual presentations. So they are gonna show what they created. I'm gonna have some questions for them. Um, and they're gonna walk you through their process. So our first one is Trinity. So Trinity, tell us about your process for creating your gnome here. So first um, I sketched the, um, um, the um, garden gnome first and, um, and then I put it on to the um, dimension and then on to arrow. Um, which I can like move um, the character around and stuff like that. And the, the, the dimension is um, where I can build that um, character um, after I sketched it. Very nice, great process. Mm -hmm. All right, so what aspects of the UEC gnome did you use for your inspiration for your 3D model? Um, yeah, so um, the, um, the inspiration is for um, Oliver. And so it kind of looks like Oliver and um, it has like um, big um, ears so it can fly. Very nice. So you took those ears from the physical gnome and made sure you included that in your 3D model. I love it. Yeah. Um, what did you enjoy the most about creating this gnome? Um, I think it was like, um, you know, I'm playing around with um, a lot of shapes and like um, and shapes and sizes and like rotating stuff and stuff like that. Awesome. And did you learn anything new this week? What's something new you learned? Well, um, I learned how to use um, Dimension because I've never used it before and Arrow because I also never used it before. Yeah, they were brand new softwares for everyone, weren't they? You did an awesome job with learning that. Right now we're going to show a little mm -hmm. clip of your 3D model in action. So this is with the use of the software arrow. Look at that little guy. There he is. Yeah, you can see him moving on there. And then. Know. Awesome. What was the most challenging thing about creating that gnome? What was hard for you? Um. There's like a lot of tools on there. Mm, so lots of different things you had to use. Well, yeah. And um, also the challenge was, um, you know, after I restarted um, my, mom's, my mom's computer, um, I thought all of her stuff was gonna be gone. Mm -hmm. And then, then all it wasn't. That's right. We had to learn a lot around software, didn't we? I'm glad it wasn't gone. So then how did you overcome that challenge? What did you do to? Well, get through that well um i just step back a little bit and just calm down and stuff like that um that's that really helps me a lot absolutely and you shared that with our group too when we were talking about strategies for when we got frustrated you shared that and said sometimes you just need to walk away and come mm -hmm. back to it which you did an awesome job doing well you have so much to be proud of trinity this turned out awesome you are amazing mm -hmm. round of applause we got Yay. really great feedback in the chat here, Trin, about how cool the images are, how cool all new learnings. It's amazing. And uh, calling out what a great skill it is to be able to step away and take a breath. Way to go. Woo. 
All right, Alec, you are up. Let's see yours. Okay, tell us about your process for creating your gnome. So originally, I thought we got to pick the gnome that we got to create the spirits of. So this is my spirit of what I envisioned Slither would look like. So I envisioned it would be like a ball of rubber slime. Very nice. So you so, started with doing what? You did what first? I started using sketches in Illustrator where I was just making him look simple so I could easily make him in um, dimension. Mm -hmm. And then I started building off of this ball he's made out of and then put him into arrow. I love it. That's a great process visual right there. You did a lot of great steps. All right, so then the next slide is going to be where you were then given one of the UEC gnomes and you got Periwinkle. So what aspects of Periwinkle did you use in your 3D version? So Periwinkle um, can turn into a butterfly. So I made her spirit form be like a butterfly as well as the fact that she can control the water. So it's supposed to be like a plant, supposed to be like a river butterfly thing with water surrounding it, as well as since the name periwinkle is also the name of the color, the mm -hmm. eyes are peri are the shade are the color periwinkle. That's amazing. I did not know that. I just learned that. That's awesome. Um, what did you like most about making this gnome, Alec? Um, I thought it was pretty cool making the eyes and just making it look like how it does. I love it. I love your interpretation of Periwinkle. Um, what is something new that you learned this week? Um, the whole um, Adobe Dimension and Arrow. Yeah, that was new software, wasn't it? Do you think you'll use that software again? Most likely. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, let's see your little gnome in action. I love that you can really see its wings from all these different angles. Oh, I love it. So what was the hardest part about making this gnome for you? Um, some of the hardest part was like, just coming up with how to make it, like inspiration for it. Mm. Then when we got to Arrow, part of the hard parts was me coming up with what interaction, like little animations. Like I tried making it do like a jump and flip, but it kept having a weird, thing where it wasn't going back to point of origin when it did it. Mm. So then what did you do to overcome that? How did you get through that challenge? I decided to just make it be, do, have it just do a flip and just get rid of the whole jump thing. That's awesome. Well, you did a great job. You definitely persevered and it turned out amazing. Nice job, Alec. Woo. Thank you. We're that read the of great feedback in the comments here. So amazing. I love how you can see the wings. Wow, backflip. How cool. Uh, Alec, I love the eyes and the antenna and the ferns there too. Super cool to see Periwinkle in action. Nice work. Chris pointed out, um, these are, so what we're seeing is uh, the floor in Chris uh, Chris's studio on his phone. He's recording this. So in the Urban Ecology Center, when these are scanned, you will actually see this overlaid on the natural environment. And so these are just an example of what it looks like in Chris's studio right now. Um, and every time that you tap that gnome on your phone is when it flips. So they actually were working integrating in not only actions, but responses to triggers, uh, which is another level of complexity. Amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, next we have Garrett. Let's see what, so tell us about your process with making your gnome, Garrett. Um, it was pretty good. So what did you do first when you started thinking about creating your gnome? Where did you start? Oh, I started out sketching on the, uh, I started sketching out on an old sketchbook. Okay. That I haven't used in a long time. Awesome. And then what? What did you do once you got a sketch that you liked? Um, 
I think I started modeling after it and naming it. That's right. You named all the different parts, right? We did a lot of learning around saving and naming things a certain way because there were a lot of parts and groups with our gnome. So you did an excellent job of doing that. Awesome. And then once you brought it into dimension and kind of modeled it out, then what did you do? Um, I also rendered it mm -hmm. and yeah. brought it into uh, Arrow. Yep. And then once it was an Arrow, what were you able to do with your gnome? Oh, I was, uh, what else? I was going to I was giving it some activities. That's right, all those different behaviors. So yep. lots of different steps. Yep, we had to take it from one software into the next. So lots of parts that you and all the other students did an excellent job doing. All right, let's see your how you interpreted the UEC gnome. So which gnome did you get given, Garrett? Tilver. Tilver, and what parts of Tilver did you take and try to incorporate into your 3D gnome? Uh, mostly those of an anteater, an armadillo, and an aardvark. Nice. So you took kind of those animal features and used yep. that in the 3D. I love that. So what did you like most about creating your gnome, Garrett? Um, I think probably the 3D modeling. You like doing the modeling piece of it? Yeah, that was super fun. Um, and what was something new that you learned that you didn't know how to do before? Um, I think giving it some activity an arrow. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely new and sometimes hard, but you did a great job with that. So speaking of which, let's check out your video of one of your gnomes. Look at that. How cool is that? <laughs> so what was the most challenging thing about creating the gnome for you, Garrett? What was hard for you this week? Oh, trying to render it. Rendering? What was hard about that? I had too many objects too many objects. So then how did you overcome that? Did you just quit and give up? I just restarted and adding less ones. That's right. You problem solved it, right? You took out different materials. You had to restart some things. Yep. But you did not quit. We were so impressed with your resiliency, Garrett, because I probably would have quit if I had to start over and you did not do that. So very impressive work, Garrett. Awesome. All right. And again, lots of great feedback. Uh, he looks excited to meet all of us. Chris reminded us of a new word, rendering. That means to use the software to make a glamour shot version of the gnome. Uh, Amy said that she loves all the sketches and how they tie into the design. Uh, Mark said this is really fun. Lily loves how he moves around. Uh, love that you used uh, the terminology that we were learning this week. Uh, this gnome has a lot of energy. Uh, another great skill, problem solving, and so fun to see it in motion. Great work. And uh, yeah, this really has been an amazing, amazing week to see what was created in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Lots to be proud of. Nice job, Garrett. All right. Up next, Haley. All right, Haley, let's check out yours. So tell us about your process for creating your gnome. So for this one, I decided to do a cat duck, kind of like, I kind of, at the time, I kind of had Perry the platypus on my mind, so I decided, you know, instead of a beaver duck, what about a cat duck? <laughs> and so it started out kind of rectangular, but I kind of gave it a bit more of a Stremlin design to kind of differentiate it more. Very nice. So first, it looks like you did a sketch of it, and then once you yep. had that sketch, what, what did you do? Then I modeled it. Um, if you notice in that middle screenshot, it does not have feet yet. Um, that was because I kept forgetting to give it feet. <laughs> so then in that third picture, what are we seeing? You're seeing it before it before it got eyes and was like fully textured. Very nice. Yeah. Awesome. I love seeing that progression. And I love your illustrations. You're such a good illustrator. Very nice. And then which gnome were you assigned from the UEC? I was given Slither. Slither. And look at Slither. So what parts of Slither did you take or what were you inspired by that you incorporated into your model? Well, I found his kind of almost dragon-like design very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wanted to go with that. And, you know, 
even give him kind of, well, I just wanted to kind of make that villainous feel still there and then kind of give it my own little touch. I think you absolutely did that. I love that. So what did you like the most about making this gnome, Haley? Well, I think the, I honestly really liked just the fact that it came together so easily. It just went great the entire time. And I just had a lot of fun working with the different provided materials. Very cool. Do you think you'll use this software again? Probably. Yeah, that's great. So what is like the number one new thing that you learned this week, Haley? Well, definitely how to 3D model and even animate it in, you know, in Arrow, you know, all of that. That was so fun and so interesting to learn. That's really cool. Let's check out your animated version. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, there he is. Oh, I love the back of it that you can see that kind of like armadillo armor. <laughs> Very nice, Haley. So what was like the hardest part for you about making this? Because it sounds like you really enjoyed it. Most of it went easy. What was something that was challenging for you this week? Well, there was the time where I was having technical difficulties with the mouse. I was, I was restarting my computer several times. And mm -hmm. so, well, you know, shout outs to Nathan, Garrett, and dad for helping me fix it up. Dad provided this mouse that I've been using. So yeah. 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 Very good. So you didn't just quit when the mouse didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. You did some pivoting and some problem solving. You got through it. And we're so glad that you did because this turned out amazing. Lots to be proud of Haley. Nice job. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. When it comes to cat dog, somebody says the animal combo I didn't know I needed. Adorable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so fun to see part of the process. Just love seeing the thinking and process. Love it, Haley. Thanks for sharing your awesome process. Lots of love for your process. Uh, Thank you. The angry eye is amazing. So creative. We love your interpretation. The tongue is scary. Uh, <laughs> and adding the dragon aspect. Nice. Uh, this is so cool. Love the interpretation. You did a great job, Haley. Slither definite, definitely looks like a villain. Can't believe how much all of you did in one week. Absolutely. Still amazed at that. I love to hear about how much fun you had. The back is fantastic. Love the armor. You nailed it, Haley. Uh, great expressive uh, eyebrows. Chris says, yes, they went from no slash limited knowledge in this subject matter to making interactive augmented reality experiences in one week. Talk about a sprint. Mm -hmm. It is truly amazing. <laughs> um, and I will have to remember this pause, pivot, power through. This is something that we use a lot this week. Chris introduced it to us uh, on Wednesday when we were really having some major uh, challenges. And it's something that I know Jess and I definitely latched on to and the students have too. It is a, a great way to framework, uh, a great framework for when you're feeling that frustration. All right, up next, James. All right, James, let's check it out. Okay. All right, tell us about your process. Okay, so, <clears throat> Uh, uh, first of all, I, I I actually ended up creating two gnomes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, this is the first one. Mm -hmm. So uh, what this uh, what this is? It's the spirit form of Oliver. Uh, and then, hmm. yep. So where did you start? So when we gave you this challenge, what was the first thing that you did, James? So the first, so the first thing I did is uh, I thought about how I wanted it, the spirit to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, uh, uh, after looking over uh, some uh, like uh, s some stuff we wrote about about Oliver, uh, I, I I had an idea to to base uh, my spirit off of an orangutan because uh, fun fact the name orangutan means old man of the forest, oh. which I thought. It fit it, Oliver because he it, it, because he protects the forest. I love that. I love that you took the story behind Oliver and use that as inspiration as well, not just the physical part. That's really cool. Yeah. 
really nice. I think it turned out great. Mm -hmm. And then let's see which UEC gnome you were given and which one were you given? Rainkeeper. Rainkeeper. And what parts of Rainkeeper did you take and use in your model? Well, I took uh, uh, like, I, well, I, I uh, basically what I did was I, I took some stuff we wrote, uh, 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 that uh, that was written about Rainkeeper. And then I came up with this uh, frog like gnome. I love that. So it has that water connection for sure, doesn't it? Yeah. What did you like the most about creating these gnomes? Well, probably my most favorite thing is uh, uh, is uh, is learning how to uh, uh, make uh, 3D models move. Mm. Yeah, that was really cool. Definitely. So then other than just learning how to make something move, what was like the next thing that was really new learning for you that you enjoyed? Um, Anything else new that you learned that you think you'll use again? I'm not quite sure. Do you think you'll use this software again in the future, James? Oh yeah, it's really, it's really fun. Awesome, well then that's it right there, right? That's all the learning you need. Great yeah. job. All right, let's see your gnome in action. I love it. I love that it does the jumping like a frog should. Yeah. When you can see the water in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, cool. uh, this gnome was my favorite one. Yeah. Why was this one your favorite? Uh, uh, be, uh, because uh, because like uh, during the process of, of rigging it and getting all the parts to like uh, up like uh, operate how I wanted them I uh, compared to my other gnome I like this I really like this one a lot for sure and this was the last one that you made so you obviously learned a bunch of things through your first gnome right, right. so right. each time we do it we're going to learn different there's so many different tools and things we can use so it's going to get better and better so oh mm -hmm. there's the other one <laughs> there's that little guy yep <laughs> so what was any ch what was a challenge that you encountered while you were making these gnomes what was something that you had to kind of overcome um well uh, uh, for for creating the gnomes it didn't uh, go it, it didn't go too bad i i i was successful in creating both of them yeah but <laughs> um, <laughs> um uh, it, it, I, after i was done and i turned them into uh, real files uh, then I, I went to submit them in the Dropbox link in the mural, and, and, and then uh, the first time around it, it 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 was going for a little bit, then it stopped, mm -hmm. and then I was like, okay, that's weird. So I, I tried it again. Mm -hmm. It did the same thing. It it went for a little bit, then it stopped. Oh, so then and that then probably I, and, then, and then after that what? I tried a few more, and then after that I tried a few more times, and, and still I was like, you know what? I better ask for help. I love that. So you probably were feeling super frustrated, right? Yep. But you didn't quit on it and you reached out for help, right? Yep. And did it end up working? Yeah. So uh, what happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, what happened what happened was uh, the the last thing uh, the uh, the last thing that was suggested to me was to turn off my router. So so <clears throat> uh, so uh, right before I went to turn off the router, I I just decided to like uh, re re restart it one more time, just to make with submitting it. Mm -hmm. So then I I let it go for a few minutes, and, and then I, I I just as I was thinking about getting up and going to turn off the router, it it worked, it, huh? it, it, it uh, the second one successfully submitted. So then all I had to do was wait for the the other one, and then it worked as well. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's the technology that we don't even think will fail us does, but mm -hmm. we're so glad you persevered and stuck with it because this turned out amazing, James. Great job. Thanks. Absolutely, James. And lots of people were uh, loving the fact about orangutan and its meaning, not knowing that, loving the research that you did and how smart that was to put that in there, uh, that it's a great looking spirit of the gnomes. Uh, they love the addition of the water behind 
going to the gnomes. Uh, the water aspect is getting a lot of love. Chris says, look at that glamour shot. Um, <laughs> so creative, love the splashing water that you created, that it uh, creates, provides such good action. Uh, the water element is very cool. The way that you took the stories and information provided and interpreted it is amazing. Top notch work. Um, so we said that one of them looks like Mike from Monsters Inc. A lot of inspiration <laughs> from the things that we love, right? The water is amazing. The jumping and the water. Um, how cute they are. Lots of love, more love for the water. Uh, and the progress and the evolution of the gnomes is so great. Awesome work. Uh, great work, James. I really like the animations. Shows how much fun you had making this model. And Chris uh, made another point that Jess brought up a good point herself. Uh, we grew in iterations this week. Each day we learned more and more. So we started with one process and then we would just build upon it each day. And it was mm -hmm. a great way to learn. And uh, Chris was a really amazing, mm -hmm. amazingly gifted guide as, as we were moving through that. Uh, he's very talented. We're very appreciative. Uh, growth mindset, absolutely. And asking for help, another great skill. We all need a little help from now and then. So really, really great job, James. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And now right. my turn. John, it is your turn. Let's check out your process. So tell us about your process. Where did you start when you started uh, making a gnome, John? Well, I started with um, looking at the um, at the Oliver, and um, I got to go um, with the winged girl right here. This Harry Winkle, yeah. Yeah, her wings are energy. I love that. So you you looked at the the image of Periwinkle. Yeah. And then what did you do once you looked at the image of Periwinkle? Instead of getting a, tur a that turtle like thing, I was going for more of an actual girl yeah i love that you really so modeled she it should have uh, yeah she basically looks like she could come from maybe the loud house or something but then again she actually um works so you I mean, drew her out and then what, what did you do so on the left that's where you kind of sketched her right and then yeah. the, on the right side those two images what did you do there yeah well I couldn't make, I knew I wouldn't be able to make her in that form. So I had to do like a, I had to have her have some um, more like actual uh, female figure, but that would be inappropriate. So I had to go for um, just a little cone shape for the top body and the bottom body and the skirt for the bottom body. But then I, there's also the teardrop head too. Yeah, I love and the that. The wings part. are actually um, just from ASCII. No, I think that turned out great. It's a great interpretation of Periwinkle. I love it. Yeah. All right. So and then, then there's your Oliver. UEC one, you had Oliver. So which parts of Oliver did you take and use in your 3D model? Well, I took the ears, of course. Yes, those flying ears. Yeah. Anything else that you and were inspired by? And the eyes looked like a knight creature of the night and uh, yeah. looks like the basically a sort of like an angry birds pig yeah uh, it does i love that no nope, but so it. does um but so does slither so did one of the interpretations of slither you're right you. you're right i love that we can always pull from different places for inspiration can't we john yeah um what did you like the most when you were creating your gnomes well the i really liked actually putting them in uh the uh, actually putting them in the um, arrow in the mm -hmm. augmented reality. Why did you like arrow? What did you like about it? Well, it was awesome because I could actually uh, warp reality from. I felt like I was actually warping reality just by yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. And then you can kind of make it come to life, can't you, John? Yeah. Yeah. What was something new you learned? What's something that maybe is new for you that you could see yourself using in the future? Well, the dimensions, of course, and uh, Adobe Arrow. Yeah, you can see yourself using you. that software. To you're me. Gonna use that you're going to use that software again, John? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's see your gnome in action. Yeah. 
Yeah, his uh, those ears. I love them. But he isn't actually flapping. The kind of uh, failed though. Yeah, he kind of rolls instead of. He was going to flap, but. That's all right. That's something maybe you could keep working on as you play around with this, right? Yeah. We are not looking for perfection. So what was something that was challenging with making the gnomes or using this software? Well, it was only the fact that um, Dimensions doesn't have a mirror option. Oh, you did but really I could, uh, But I could, uh, but I did uh, wherever I um, get to. Um, but then again, it's kind of memory consuming to have a mirror option anyway. Okay, so then how did you overcome but then again, that? But, or maybe not. Maybe then again, well, it's not quite memory consuming, but still. Sure, sure. Um, but still, it's a little bit hard to program. But sure. then again, I, well, it's actually not that hard to program, I think, but maybe it's just to save memory. Okay, so they didn't have that mirror option. So what did you do? So I actually, um, I actually just um, rotated and then flipped it around to a negative value, to the opposite value. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you problem solved and you figured yeah. it out and made it work. Yeah. That was awesome. Great work, John. Really nice. And then John also animated, have a video. gave us a video of Harry Winkle. Winkle. We got another one. That's right. This one's a little better. What do you like more about this one, John? This one's a little more in my room. So you like it because of the background, like the environment? Yeah. Well, and that's what's amazing about augmented reality, right? When it's on your phone, it can show up anywhere. You can bring it with you anywhere. It's kind of the magic yeah. of VR. I love when you try and grab it. So close. Really nice work, John. Great job, John. And yes, lots of love for these as well. Uh, love the interpretation. A lot of love for the rainbows that you put in with Periwinkle. Love to see the sketches and how they became to life in 3D. Great work. Uh, so cool how the ears turn into wings. Talk about multitasking. <laughs> we wish our ears could do that. Uh, your inspiration of Oliver is so cool, and it's great to hear your feelings about Arrow. Chris says, you was augmenting reality. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the texture is really cool. Great work, John. Uh, awesome to see how much inspiration you pulled from the real gnomes and the things that interest you. Mm -hmm. uh, look at all you learned that you wanted a, uh, and that you wanted the mirror option, but you found a workaround. Chris says that sounds like a push, right? And uh, more problem solving and she rotates. So much detail added to Periwinkle. Really cool seeing you experiment with the new software and seeing your gnome in real life. Awesome. Nice job, John. Great. All right, Mackenzie. <laughs> so Mackenzie, tell us about your process with making your gnome. Um, my inspiration came from the gnome that I made at the Urban Ecology Center, Rinzi. So where did you start? I start for coconut. Lindsay, I started illustrating her on Adobe Illustrator. Okay. And which is a which is the opposite of what I did with for my other gnome. Hmm. Aspen. I just drew it on um a notebook, my sketch. And why is that? Is there a reason that you chose to switch it up? I guess I think because Aspen was, because of the features it has, hmm. I feel like drawing Rinzi is, I feel like drawing Rinzi would be easier on Illustrator than drawing Aspen on Illustrator. Got it. And Rinzi was inspired by the Kokodamas from the UEC, right? Yeah, specifically my Kokodama, Rinzi. Right. Do you want to um, share with the people that don't know what a kokodama is? A kokodama is a moss ball plant. It literally means moss ball in Japanese. That's right. And how did so, you use the kokodamas at the UEC? What did you do with them? We gave them, them names. We gave them, we turned them into gnomes by giving them arms, legs, 
That's right. Uh, that's right. So that's how you made your physical personal gnome was those kokodamas. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see what UEC gnome you were given. Which one were you given? Aspen. Aspen. And what parts of Aspen were you inspired by or using your 3D model? I use a lot of reference to real life animals for making Aspen. That was like based on what the PowerPoint said. That's right. Yeah. Aspen was made up of a lot of animals and I can see that in yours. Awesome. So what did you like the most about creating Aspen? Uh, uh, I enjoyed just three, just making it on dimension. You like the dimension part of it? Yeah. Awesome. And what was something new you learned this week that you could see yourself using again in the future? Uh, if we use dimension again, I learned how to scale, orbit, zoom, uh, add textures and lighting. So you learn lots. That's awesome. Great. Well, let's see your gnome in action. I love that tail. Awesome. What was hard about either making your gnome or just challenging this week? What challenge did you encounter this week, Mackenzie? Uh, my laptop was laggy because Dimension is kind of a big software. Yeah, and that's kind of frustrating, right? When it's yeah. not as fast as we want it to be. So how did you overcome that? What did you do to get through that? I just pushed through. Just stuck with it? Mm-hmm. I love that because that's something for me that would have made me maybe want to quit. Um, but I'm very proud of you that you didn't, that you stuck with it and you created something really, really cool. So great job, Mackenzie. Mm. Absolutely. Um, we are seeing a lot of love in here. Once again, really cool. I love this one brings back the Colt Kodama aspect. Your first gnome looks like a good boo. Uh, Tanika. Uh, so it looks like good boo and uh mackenzie rinzi looks very cool so cute love the tail i can see the inspiration from the face it's so creative i love how your design follows your sketch and uh love the pin and or the spin ruby says uh and chris was saying from uh replying to amy's comment about the seeing the inspiration from the sketch and going through that it's straight up magical to see students' drawings turn into models and then appear in his studio. That is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, more powering through and loving, uh, loving that powering through. See how your sketches and how they evolve. Uh, this is great work, Mackenzie. Love to hear how you push through. Love how you stuck with it. Sometimes laptops can be a little tricky, especially when they don't work out. And love how you stuck with it. Great job, Mackenzie. Awesome. Nice job, Mackenzie. All right. Last but not least, Nathan. Hello. Hello. So let's check out your process. Tell us about where you started and kind of the steps you took, Nathan. Um, yeah. So I apparently don't have any paper in my house. So I just pulled up MS Paint and started just kind of like drawing to try and get some ideas. Uh, my first, so my gnome was Periwinkle. Uh, well, okay, at the time, we it kind of changed. So before it was Rainkeeper, but Periwinkle and Rainkeeper are very similar, so it doesn't really matter. But on the left is my first drawing, which was basically a cloud looking figure who had like a staff that could like control lightning or whatever. And my second drawing was supposed to be a ball of lightning, but it ended up looking like spaghetti or like brain <laughs> neurons or something. Um, <laughs> and then on the right, um, was when I actually started modeling my gnome. Um, I tried to make clouds, um, in the beginning in, uh, what is it, dimension, um, but that didn't quite work out because I was kind of new to it. So those three rings on the gnome at the top, right, uh, were my attempt at a cloud. And then we got the asset kit and kind of brought that stuff in. And then on the bottom is my history for the first day. Kind of just pulling in the textures and what you're actually seeing right there is a normal map for the uh, bumpiness of certain 
textures on the gnome on the top. Nice. I love that progression of, of your thinking. And I know that it, it kept evolving because on our next slide, we get to see how you took inspiration from the UEC gnome that you were assigned and kind of made that your own. So tell us about what you drew from the physical gnome and incorporated into your 3D model. Um, yeah, so Periwinkle, I remember, uh, was able to control water levels, prevent animals from drowning, and was able to fly. And because I'm terrible at 3D modeling, I ended up deciding, you know what, it's not going to fly, it's going to bounce fly. So the gnome on the right kind of just bounces on the pot around, kind of like flying. And then the staff there he has is actually made out of ice, and it can raise and lower the water levels, just like how the backstory of Periwinkle said. And That's awesome. yeah, the, sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to say, I, was, I love how you took in the storytelling as well. You didn't just look at the physical, but you listened to the story. It turned out really, really cool, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what did you like most about making either this gnome or the whole process itself? What was kind of your favorite part? Um, yeah, so um, um, like I said, I don't really enjoy 3D modeling. I kind of just do it for the sake of it. But as soon as we got everything kind of hooked up and going through AR and we started um, block baby coding the interaction system and triggers and stuff, um, it kind of became more fun that I got to see like this thing jumping around in my bedroom or basement, same thing. Totally. I feel yeah. like you really seem kind of in your element when it was in arrow and you could kind of change all the different numbers to do the different behaviors and you were finding things that like we hadn't even demonstrated you just had a really natural way of going around arrow so great work with that yeah i found a few exploits in the uh animation system too so, nice nice yeah. so what was something new that you learned that you think you would maybe use again in the future um, I really do appreciate like the AR. It was mm -hmm. very nice to kind of learn how to make augmented reality stuff. Um, I don't seem like I would definitely use it again in the future if like I would, but I don't really see a need to do it, but it's definitely something I would want to do if I got the time. That's awesome. Well, it's great that you have that in your toolkit now. Oh, that's right. What's got to share this next part, Nathan. Oh yeah, so um, this is um, Periwinkle and the image on the top is actually an audio clip that I took of kind of me screaming. And the reasoning for that is because um, when you tap the gnome, um, or so, sorry, my mom's just creepily watching me right over <laughs> my shoulder. <laughs> um, so I took an audio clip of kind of myself screaming like, meh, meh because of the gnome said he was like scared and would like to go invisible whenever humans came by in his backstory her periwinkle story I don't know if it's here or her or what um, but that was kind of the backstory so I made it so in the in the interaction system when you click on the gnome it disappears and makes that weird audio clip and I spent a solid 30 minutes trying to make that audio clip sound the best it could with different <laughs> filters and then on the bottom left is the weird blocky baby coding animation trigger system. I mean, if you want to play the video, there is some, um, there's my scream if you want to hear it. I can't reproduce it though, so. Here it goes. Okay. Oops. Hold, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, how I did that, but I did. We'll see. And I think that was like how you say, like, this wasn't for me or whatever, but I, uh, <laughs> you explored this software so much, like, and just found this on your own and made it work. And I think it added so much. I think you did awesome with it. Very nice. All right. Let's check out your gnome in action. I haven't seen this yet. So this oh, could be a disaster. <laughs> Yeah, so um, basically what it's doing right now is it's kind of just jumping around an anchor point in the scene because why not? Um, I found a way to kind of make it ease in and out so it looked like it was accelerating, bouncing in the front and then slowly unbouncing at the end. And due to like the rotation blurping in the animation system's kind of broken, um, it wasn't always facing the center point, which originally I was kind of upset with and I was like, hey, I need it to always face the center point. Um, but then I kind of just pivoted on that and was like, you know what, we're just gonna have it kind of turn 
how it is. It's not a bug. It's a feature because I don't want to fix it. I'm lazy. And also because it looks cool. So I love, you just answered my question, the challenge you faced and how you overcame it. And I love, I feel like you did a lot of pivoting, Nathan, um, where something didn't go exactly the, maybe you, the way you thought it would go. And then you found a solution. So really great work with that, Nathan. Nice job. Absolutely. People are really commenting a lot on how you use the resources that were available, uh, how the texturing, that was really cool to see that portion of it. Um, looks like you were able to incorporate your development skills into this project. Uh, Chris says that your first shot looks like an album cover from a band I've never heard of, which- Wait, what shot? Really cool. Your glamour Wait, what... shot. Let's see if I- Glamour shot. There we go. Oh, that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. For, uh, Flaming Pines. I don't know if you've heard of them. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I mean, it could be like turtle duck plant face or something. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't same, know what I was making. I just, as, I don't know Flaming what Pines. I was making. I just made it. So- <laughs> Yeah, uh, lots of love for the water and the ice aspects. One comment, wowie zowie. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, baby, mm, coding, mm. baby coding, you would say that, Nathan. Of course, that was uh, way more fun for you. And you powered through the beta. Um, and lots of love and uh, thought the, the name or the sound was really funny. Um, and loving to see the, how much fun you had with it. Great exploration of all the tools. And uh, the shadow that's added. So the shadow is added uh, in the system by the lighting that's chosen when they when they do the modeling. Um, and just heard. Yeah, that was a tri point lighting system. Yep. And uh, again, love the sound effect. So great job, Nathan. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let's give all of these students some love for their resiliency and their creativity. Um, it was just overflowing all around and we are so proud um, and you should all be so proud of your hard work and your perseverance through this project. So great job. Really nice work. Absolutely. It was amazing. Uh, we do have just a few minutes. Uh, we're running a little long. So just a few minutes if there are any questions or comments that any of the parents would like to give or IOB, we have lots of, lots of guests here. There's lots of great love in the chat. Well, we like to end every workshop with our gratitude for sure. Uh, and we have so much to be thankful for uh, with this workshop. And we want to first start off by just uh, thanking the, our, our partners in this large experience, both in person and online, the Urban Ecology Center and the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee High School of the Arts. Not only Chris uh, is a professor there at UWM, but Kim Beckman and Co Douglas, both are uh, educators that are uh, part of the Peck School of the Arts who helped run our in-person experience. And we are just so grateful for all the time and knowledge and expertise that was shared with us, the planning, uh, you know, teachers get their summers off. Not every professor does uh, as summer school, but it was a busy summer and they sent their summer with us planning. And then also executing these amazing workshops right at the time that they are starting a new semester. And so this really was a huge lift and a crunch. And we're so appreciative of that. The Urban Ecology Center and especially our contact Megan there, that was our lead contact. Uh, who hosted us for the three workshops at Riverside, at uh, Washington Park, and also uh, Menominee Valley, Menominee River. Uh, it was just a, a great experience all around. So the three organizations here in Milwaukee coming together to really create this amazing experience for everyone. Uh, we're just so, so grateful for that. Huge thanks to Chris Willey, our expert uh, for this week. Chris, thank you so much. Uh, not only did our students learn a lot, but I know Jess and I were constantly talking about how much we learned from uh, watching you two and hope to be better teachers uh, just by sharing this time with you. So thank you so much, Chris, for your time. In addition, we can't do this without our mentors. Uh, and also Ryan and Ruby are students at the Peck School of the Arts and continuing that UWM partnership. Uh, thank you for your time as you're about to start your new semester. Kevin, thank you as always for your time. Uh, shared with us. This was a great experience. 
uh, students. Let's give our mentors and Chris a big round of applause and lots of thanks. And finally, as always, um, our students, our families and our community, we can't do this without you. So thank you so much for your trust in us, your time uh, invested with us and uh, allowing the access that we have to do these amazing, amazing workshops with your families. Before we go, there is one thing we just wanna remind everybody, registration for the fall is open and it's filling quickly. So we wanna make sure nobody misses out on any of the opportunities. You can go to bit.ly slash IOB hyphen programs or scan that QR code right there at the end. Our digital academy workshops are starting up in September. They will be Mondays and Tuesday evenings from four to six. We are going to be doing a really cool experience where the students will be creating a social awareness campaign around a topic of their choice. So uh, as a group, we'll find something relevant uh, to them and then choose how we are going to execute that campaign. So it'll be a two month sprint where the students will really be driving the content uh, and the experience and then incorporating all their creativity and all of the different softwares and everything that we've learned in design thinking throughout. Our foundation workshops are available. Uh, those are filling quickly, always a really fun experience for everybody, as well as our sandbox. And for those 18 plus, Brilliant Breakfast Club is always a great uh, experience and uh, a lot of fun. We are going back to in-person BBC uh, every second Wednesday, starting September 9th, I believe. Uh, I think that's a Wednesday. Uh, no, Amy's shaking her head. Go off mute, Amy. Give me the right date. It's the 8th. Yeah, 8th. Okay, uh, September 8th. So that second Wednesday, we will be having that, but as well, Brilliant Breakfast Club runs online every Friday morning from 10 to 11. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us, students. We hope you had as much fun as we had hanging out with you. Uh, if your work shows just a smidge of the level of fun that you had doing it, absolutely brilliant uh, and wonderful. So thanks for joining us. Thank you everybody and have a beautiful weekend.